Greetings. Good morning. Welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean. Website, scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to find the archives. That's where you go to support this mission of truth. This morning we are looking to start our week with some wisdom and some encouragement. We're ready for Psalm 55 today, a psalm of David. And we're also starting Ecclesiastes, uh, which we've been through before. uh, But we've been through all of this before. And Ecclesiastes, I think, will prove to be uh, sobering, might be a word to use, Uh, but we'll get into that this morning, the first chapter this morning. Usually I read some Matthew Henry commentary at the end of a reading, but today we're actually going to use it to give us a background of Psalm 55 and what we're uh, looking at here in these 23 verses. So let me start with that information real quick, and then we'll get to Psalm 55. Here's what Matthew Henry says about it. It is the conjecture of many expositors that David penned this psalm upon occasion of Absalom's rebellion, and that that particular enemy here that he speaks of, that dealt treacherously with him, was Ahithophel. And some will therefore make David's troubles here typical of Christ's sufferings. And Ahithophel, Ahithophel's treachery, a figure of Judas, because they both hanged themselves. But there is nothing in particular applied to Christ in the New Testament. David was in great distress when he penned this psalm. He prays that God will manifest his favor to him and pleads his own sorrow and fear. He prays that God would manifest his displeasure against his enemies and pleads their great wickedness and treachery. He assures himself that God would, in due time, appear for him against his enemies, comforts himself with the hopes of it, and encourages others to trust in God. In singing this psalm, we may, if there be occasion, apply it to our own troubles If not, we may sympathize with those whose case it comes nearer, foreseeing that there will be, at last, indignation and wrath to the persecutors, and salvation and joy to the persecuted. So there's just a little backdrop, a little information about what we're getting ready to read. Psalm 55, David is distressed. Let's begin. Verse 1. Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from my supplication. Attend unto me and hear me. I mourn in my complaint and make a noise. Because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they cast iniquity upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is sore pained within me, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and the horror hath overwhelmed me. And I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and be at rest. Lo, then I would wander far off and remain in the wilderness. Selah. I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest, Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues. For I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go about upon the walls thereof. Mischief also and sorrow are in the midst of it. Wickedness is in the midst thereof. Deceit and guile apart not from her streets. For it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me, that I did magnify myself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man, my equal, my guide, and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God in company. Let death seize upon them, and let them go down quick into hell, for wickedness is their dwelling and among them. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning, at noon I will pray, 
and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many with me. God shall hear and afflict them, even he that abideth of old. Selah. Because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. He hath put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. He hath broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet were they drawn swords. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. But thou, O God, shall bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days. But I will trust in thee. That, my friends, is Psalm 55. Just a couple more things I'll add uh, to what we've already discussed. You know, one of the greatest betrayals are those of family, close friends, but also those within the church itself. Those may prove to be some of the hardest to get past and to overcome because you have a high expectation of the people who claim Christ as Savior and the way that they would behave and how the one of the main commandments Christ gives is that you would love one another, specifically talking about the brethren. And they'll know you by how you love one another, specifically talking about how you love the brethren in the faith. And what does David say here? He says, we took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God in company. And then the last thing I'll say here, verse 22, a very famous verse, cast thy burden upon the Lord. He shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Please note, David's not saying he'll never allow the righteous to suffer. He's saying the righteous are immovable, even when the winds are blowing up against them. He will not suffer the righteous to be moved. All right. Let's move on to the book of Ecclesiastes, or could be called The Preacher. And uh, in fact, Solomon even refers to himself as the preacher uh, in Ecclesiastes. So the main theme, I mean, is that no matter what men do, in light of the fact that eventually we all have to stand before God, in light of the fact that there's nothing new under the sun, I mean, anything that's been, that's happening has been done in some form before. In light of everything, it's all for nothing, <laughs> is uh, tragically uh, the reality. It's all vanity. I mean, anything we do in this world, it'll never really satisfy. We'll have momentary pleasure from it. In the moment, you know. Um, but it, it, nothing satisfies but God. And all the toil and the work that we do, which we have to do to survive, in light of eternity, in light of judgment, it's, again, vanity. It's for nothing. And it's, it's sobering, to say the least. And those are the main points I think Solomon is making. You know, he's the wisest man to ever live. He's got all the wisdom, but he says, with wisdom comes sorrow. This is something I've learned myself. The more I've learned, as I've poured my life and my heart and my soul into the work of the kingdom and God's word for going on a decade now, the more I've learned, the more sorrow it does bring. Because, you know, you can't unknow 
what you know, right? Uh, when you realize what the world really is about and God reveals things to you and you see the level of deception and lies about history, about the world, things that a majority of your family and friends couldn't even begin couldn't even begin to try to comprehend. They would just immediately reject it because the deception over decades and decades and decades of public school propaganda, higher education propaganda, people have been programmed and we're at a time now where you, know, you just can't reach many with much. And so for me, that line... The more with knowledge comes sorrow. And you realize <laughs> where it's all headed, right? I get what Solomon's saying. He says, the more I've learned, the more heartache I have. The more I realize that it's all vanity. It's all for nothing. Nothing satisfies. You know, Solomon had it all. Power, money, women, endless and he realized that there's just no satisfaction in it. Only God. So, let's have a look. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Let's begin. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath a man of all his labor which he has taken under the sun? One generation passes away, and another generation cometh, but the earth abideth forever. The sun also arises, and the sun goeth down, and hastes to its place where it arose. The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about to the north, and it whirleth about continuously, and the wind returneth again according to its circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. All things are full of labor, man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been, it hath that which shall be, and that which is done, that which it shall be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new? It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that shall come after. Please note. First thing he says is, you know, one, one generation comes and disappears and another one comes in. And these generations, they just keep coming and then disappearing. Meanwhile, everything else continues as it's supposed to. The sun goes where it's supposed to go. The wind goes where it's supposed to go. The rivers go where it's supposed to go. The earth remains. The people disappear. He says, you think there's something new? It's been done before. It's been done before. Now, you may, be, you may have been lied to about history. And you think, oh, this is new, but it's not. It's been done before. And here's the thing to go along with that. With what I just said about history. Where... We just stopped. Verse 11. There is no remembrance of former things. You see, we never really learn from history. We never even remember it. And history is told by those who control. There is no remembrance of former things. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come. With those that shall come after. He's saying, we don't know history and we don't remember it. And then the ones that come after us, they're not going to know it or remember it either. We'll just keep repeating the same stupidity. It's all vanity, is what he's saying. I apologize if this is depressing. 
Sometimes the truth is. Verse 12, I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I gave my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all things that are done under heaven. This sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. I communed, I communed with my own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly, and I perceived that this is also... This also is a vexation of spirit. So what's he saying here? He's saying, everything is vanity and everything vexes my spirit. Specifically talking about knowledge. He's like, I've gotten more knowledge than anyone. Ever. And what I've come to conclude is that it's just vex it just adds more vexation to my spirit. The more knowledge I get, the more my, my spirit is vexed. Last verse, verse 18, For in much wisdom is much grief. And he that increases in knowledge increases in sorrow. very sobering text this morning but it's God's truth apart from Christ there is no satisfaction apart from God there is no satisfaction we chase these things these trinkets they leave us more empty than before I pray you've been strengthened this morning and blessed this morning even with hard truth. Thanks for listening, friends. Thank you for your support and for your prayers. Peace and grace be with all of you. And until next time, God bless.